In ripperology, misleading or even false information can get halfway around the world before the truth even gets its britches on. In this episode, I'll look at some recent misinformation and this takes me back to Bucks Row, in which I seem to have been camped out recently. Just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. Hopefully, I can avoid filming within Sainsbury's and I'm half expecting the manager to come out and ask what I'm, what I'm doing, thinking I'm one of those nuisance auditors who uh, go and provoke arguments within businesses to get an entertaining film and clicks on YouTube. But this film is about the exit routes from Bucks Row. If it was not Lechmere, how did the culprit escape? So this film is only tangentially about Lechmere. Hurrah, some of you might think. But I'll obviously have cause to mention Lechmere and I will show that it is far away more likely than not that the culprit was indeed Lechmere. The misinformation I mentioned at the outset was in a recent YouTube film. I'll provided a link below so you can see it for yourself and it's about the exit routes from Bucks Row. And that film was an exercise in misinformation, withheld information and obfuscation, as will become apparent. The film was on a channel called Jack the Ripper Tours, run by Richard Jones, who is rightly a very respected ripperologist, which makes the errors in the film even more important to correct. In it, he interviews someone called Steve Bloomer. Steve Bloomer has written a book called Inside Bucks Row, which I'll link to below as well. You needn't necessarily watch this other film to follow what I'm saying in this film. One of the first pieces of outright misinformation was unfortunately provided by Richard Jones, a very nice guy, and generally he's very knowledgeable. But I have to call him out on this error. He was describing how Lechmere arrived on the scene and that Lechmere stated in his inquest testimony the initially thought the body of Polly Nichols was a tarpaulin. And this was indeed in his testimony. This conveyed two things. Firstly, that it was dark, and secondly, that he didn't even know that it was a body. And that put figurative distance between himself and the corpse. But generations of ripperologists added to this, claiming that Lechmere went across the road on a mission to scavenge this tarpaulin, to use it on his wagon. Lechmere was, after all, a carman, a cart delivery driver. This added, this invented rationalisation gives Lechmere an innocent excuse for crossing the road. It makes him innocent, but the scavenging of the tarpaulin is pure invention. I exposed this quite a few years ago, but I'm afraid Richard Jones must have uh, not heard about this and still thought that the old Ripper myth was true. And inevitably, Steve Bloomer, who presents himself as a neutral expert on fact, factual information about Bucks Row, which of course he isn't, didn't correct Richard Jones when he made that, those, that gaffe, which he repeated twice. It might seem a bit anal, getting uptight about the, the tarpaulin scavenging myth, but I'm a stickler for factual accuracy in this case. If I make any mistakes, and I occasionally do, I welcome viewers to point them out to me. Occasionally, for example, I garble some detail in my verbosity. In my last film about uh, Robert Paul the Witness, I got one little segment of information back to front, but no one seemed to notice, although I did uh, correct it in the caption that accompanied the, my, my verbal mistake. And again, I'm probably seeming very anal in, in coming out with that. But I'll emphasise for one last time that when Richard Jones said of Lechmere and the tarpaulin, he thought it might prove useful for a cover for his wagon, so he went to inspect it. This has absolutely no basis in fact, but Richard kind of got the memo. Who would think that a humble tarpaulin would help to solve this case? Before we set out the escape options for a culprit who is not Lechmere, I will set the scene. It was just before 3.45 on the morning of the 31st of August, 1888. Mary Ann, or Polly Nichols, was lying dead across the gateway of Brown Stable Yard on Bucks Row. That is, 
if her life was truly extinct at that moment. All traces of human life rarely expire immediately upon the event which causes death. A leading forensic pathologist, Dr. Jason Payne James, pointed out that when the two main neck arteries are severed, as they were in this case, clinical death will occur within a matter of minutes due to the brain being starved of blood. The clock for Polly's death starts ticking from that moment. The examining doctor, Dr Llewellyn, felt that Polly's abdominal wounds came before her throat wounds and she almost certainly had been strangled before either. Hence the lack of arterial spray from the throat wound. Llewellyn felt that she had been killed about 30 minutes or less before he examined the body, which fits for the timing of around 3.45 or a little before. The first witness on the scene after Lechmere, Robert Paul, said he felt a movement on Polly's breast, like the breath of a small child, probably the last shudder of life leaving her body. Both Lechmere and Paul reported a lack of visible blood on the scene, despite Paul saying that the body was, was plain to see. He didn't think Polly was a tarpaulin, for example, he could clearly see her hat and that her legs were uncovered. They were confused about the lack of blood and put that down to the light or the poor light, but clearly it wasn't that dark. The lack of blood can only realistically be explained by it slowly oozing out under gravity from a very freshly administered wound rather than, than pumping out under pressure from a still functioning heart. So we have a very freshly slain body. As I said, the clock really starts ticking from when the, the neck arteries were severed and that must have been just before as the last vestiges of life were still apparent. Furthermore, the abdominal wounds had been covered. It is fairly clear that displaying these wounds to cause shock and awe to the first finder was part of the process that Jack the Ripper strongly preferred, an activity he indulged in with all the other victims where he had time to leave them on display. But why did the culprit cover the wounds if he wasn't going to interact with the person who disturbed him? Or if that person was still a long way off down Bucks Row. Also, those abdominal wounds were far less pronounced than in other cases where the abdomen had been attacked, suggesting again that the culprit did not have time to develop fully his vile signature. All this evidence points to the murder taking place very close to the time that Lechmere who we, for the sake of this video, we're presuming was an innocent passerby, was walking up to the crime scene, with Robert Paul, of course, some 45 yards behind him. We can effectively narrow the window down to within five minutes of Lechmere's appearance if you want to stretch it to the maximum. Even Steve Bloomer agrees that the murder must have taken place within five and one and a half minutes of Lechmere's arrival. So this mysterious culprit escaped unnoticed when Lechmere must have been somewhere in Bucks Row. Logically, Lechmere must have unknowingly disturbed the killer who escaped silently into the night like a phantom, just as Robert Paul and Lechmere were unaware of each other's presence. After leaving the body, Lechmere and Paul walked westwards down Bucks Row and were both seen leaving the area by PC Jonas Meisen on the corner of Hanbury Street and Baker's Row, although he didn't regard them with suspicion as he believed them to be messengers sent by another officer who turned out to be PC John Neal. But where did the Phantom go? What options did he have? This is where the obfuscation starts, with Steve Boomer devoting a considerable amount of time and effort in detailing all the various options that a potential culprit might have available to him to escape from Bucks Row. He's also written an 800-page book on the subject and he's appeared in multiple podcasts and films covering the same ground. His aim is to show that a potential culprit could leave this area by anyone from a multitude of escape routes before Lechmere himself had left Bucks Row. By providing this multitude of different options, he creates the impression 
that getting away from Bucks Row, that the area around Bucks Row was as leaky as a sieve. And this is the obfuscation that we will put to the test. This was Steve Bloomer's opening gambit. There actually were many, many possible escape routes. Richard Jones then quoted the coroner from his final summing up when he said, his appearance might in that way have failed to attract attention while he passed from Bucks Row in the twilight into Whitechapel Road and was lost sight of in the morning's market traffic. Both failed to mention the police view as expressed by Inspector Helson in a statement he made on the evening of Sunday the 2nd of September. These officers had seen no man leaving the spot to attract attention and the mystery is most complete. The police certainly thought it was a mystery how the perpetrator managed to get away unnoticed from this location, but this information was withheld from the viewers of this particular film. Of the many, many possibilities, Steve Bloomer started with the houses on Bucks Row. Under this possibility, the unknown killer went back down Bucks Row towards the approaching Lechmere and hid in one of the houses that presumably fortuitously had an unlocked front door. This will give you the taste of the possibilities that Steve Bloomer thinks is worthy of consideration. After hiding there undetected, the killer would have to reappear once he was sure Paul and Lechmere had left, and then run the risk of bumping into one of the policemen who would by then be closing in on Bucks Row. But it isn't really worth thinking too much about this option. The next option was that the killer might have hidden in Brown Stable Yard, but we know it was locked. And we know that beat constables check the locks and the doors on commercial premises while they're on their rounds, which discounts all the other businesses that Steve Bloomer also considers. And most also had live-in caretakers. I say we know that beat constables routinely checked the doors of business premises, but quite possibly Steve Bloomer didn't, or he just omitted to say it. We'll see that he seemingly deliberately omitted to pass on lots of other pieces of information relevant for the viewer on this case that totally changes the perspective of how many viable routes out of Bucks Row existed for this mystery culprit. Steve also wasted words discussing the possibility that the culprit went through the lock gate of Brown Stable Yard and somehow got through the back of the yard which was closed off by another building and, it, and exited through a non-existent door onto Winthrop Street which runs behind here which was the road behind Bucks Row. At this point not entirely surprisingly, Richard Jones asked for sensible escape routes only. Steve Bloomer then considered the westerly direction towards the board school and away from the approach of Lechmere. The corner of the board school was about 45 yards away from Brown Stable Yard. The school itself, of course, would have been locked and checked as a matter of course by PC Neil, and there was a caretaker. But nevertheless, they discussed the possibility that the killer might have hidden in the school. Presumably this was thought to be a sensible suggestion, but it isn't. Steve Bloomer next considered Winthrop Street, which you reach by coming left around the board school and then left again. There's a tiny little fag end of it that is still here. He considered the option of the killer going all the way down Winthrop Street to Brady Street or cutting down two alleys on the right that led straight to Whitechapel Road. One, Nelson Court, was further down Winthrop Street, the other, Wood Buildings, was nearer the board school end. However, sitting in Winthrop Street, just here, was Patrick Mulshaw, a night watchman who was guarding some sewage works in the road, behind the Whitechapel Working Lads Institute. Mulshaw testified that he was awake between 3 and 4 a.m. Mulshaw didn't believe he'd dozed between those hours. He said he saw two policemen and one passerby who told him about the murder. He immediately went to the crime scene where he saw some policemen and various bystanders. This means they must have been told about the murder by that passerby after 4am and so the passerby cannot have been the culprit, just to make that point clear. Mulshaw blocks Winthrop Street as a viable escape route, certainly for Nelson Court and the far end of Winthrop Street, and he was only about 30 yards from the entrance to Woods Buildings, which makes that problematic as a viable escape route. To artificially keep these routes open, Steve Bloomer 
totally failed to mention Mulshaw. The sin of omission. There's plenty more to come in this episode, so please carry on watching and please subscribe, like and comment to help with the old YouTube algorithms, but on with the story. This is the remains of Winthrop Street. Mulshaw, the night watchman, would have been just behind that wall. That wall wasn't there. The street went right down, running parallel to Bucks Row. And we can see the end here, uh, the light coloured bricks, right here where my finger's pointing, that is where wood buildings used to come out, right there. So Mulshaw, who was the night watchman, sitting right in the middle of the road, looking after some, some road works essentially, just past that uh, brick wall. He would have been sitting there without the brick wall being there. Is it feasible that Song could have got down Wood's buildings without him noticing. He said he was awake between three and four. It seems unlikely, doesn't it? The other option, past the board school, was to carry on in a westerly direction, where the first side road on the left, off to Whitechapel Road, was Court Street. Further on from Court Street was Thomas Street, which also led to Whitechapel Road. If the culprit carried on, they would reach this T-junction and they could either turn this way south, again to Whitechapel Road, or that way north up Baker's Row, from which they'd be able to access Hanbury Street and Old Montague Street. From where, as Steve Bloomer said, the options once you get there are enormous. Returning to Bucks Row, on the right or northern side, there was Queen Anne Street, which ran roughly up here, which ran alongside the Great Eastern Railway Yard. The entrance to that yard was roughly where the entrance to the sports centre is. Queen Anne Street was a dead end, uh, although there was a side road off it called Cross Street, which connected to the next turning on the northern side, which is the continuation of Thomas Street. Steve Bloomer speculated that the killer might have jumped over the wall from the top end of Queen Anne Street into the Great Eastern Railway Yard, where there were goods marshalling rail tracks. This would naturally have been a secure location with walls that discouraged random climbers. The Great Eastern Railway employed a policeman PC81, the GER, on their gate back down there to discourage intruders. So the idea that the culprit might have clambered over this boundary wall and scarped across the tracks is fanciful. The presence of PC81 GER was also naturally omitted. Steve Bloomer also speculated that the phantom culprit might have a bolt hole somewhere in this area, which is on a par to his suggestion that the killer hid in a house on Bucks Row. Continuing along the northern side, the next turning is Thomas Street, which, as I said, was a continuation of the Thomas Street on the southern side, and could also be accessed via Queen Anne Street. From Thomas Street, the only way out was to Baker's Row, around or through some recreation grounds, which are now called Valence Gardens, which would pitch any potential culprit up on Baker's Row, quite close to the junction with Hanbury Street. At this point, Steve Bloom amused, there are so many possibilities. And he added some more, that the killer might have jumped down the district railway line, which was quite a drop. This is the original wall boundary of what is now the district line. It wasn't called the district line then. It's below here. And the railway ran this way. Whitechapel was the end of the line, actually. So it went that way. Is it feasible, when you look at the drop on the other side, that the culprit could have climbed over there and fallen down onto the railway line? Hardly. Or even down to the Great Eastern Railway track, which was an even greater drop. And the distance down to the Great Eastern Railway line is even further. It's way down in the bowels of the station now, and you can't see it. You used to be able to see the, the drop a couple of years ago, but this uh, new extension to the Whitechapel station has covered it all up, or even via some imaginary sewers. They then moved on to PC Misen, claiming he wasn't particularly bothered about anyone passing him while he was on knocking up duty. This meant that Misen was slowly walking his beat, knocking on doors that had paid their local police station to receive an early morning call for work. Actually, it was reported that Misen had seen no one to attract attention. It doesn't mean that he was oblivious to anyone passing nearby. He excluded Lechmere and Paul from this categorisation as he believed them to be messengers from another constable. Steve Bloomer claimed PC Misen had appeared from Old Montague Street based on one stray outlier report from one newspaper when all the other 
police reports and newspaper accounts of the same testimony place Misen around the corner of Hanbury Street and Baker's Row. This is where Lechmere and Paul found him, probably less than five minutes after any phantom killer could have passed by unnoticed. And as Misen was on a slow moving patrol, knocking on doors and waiting for a response, it's unreasonable to propose that Misen was very far away from this corner five minutes earlier. Note that the escape routes that Steve Bloomer mentioned via Baker's Row, north up towards Old Montague Street and Hanbury Street, or via the northern section of Thomas Street, or around the, the recreation ground, are all effectively closed off by the presence of PC Misen on the junction of Hanbury Street and Baker's Row. But of course, this is not mentioned in the film, yet another sin of omission. By eliminating the presence of PC Misen, Steve Bloomer was suggesting that any of these northern routes were viable. The last possibility that Steve Bloomer remembered to include was that the killer just walked down Bucks Row, eastwards, without being seen by Lechmere. After this torrent of obfuscation, with I don't know how many discountable possibilities one after another, Richard Jones suggests that the killer would have escaped onto Whitechapel Road, as suggested by the coroner, and his favoured option was via Woods Buildings. Woods Buildings always attracted a certain mystique amongst old school ripperologists, who were attracted by its sinister and dark atmosphere. It was nicknamed by some Piss Alley, but I don't think it's a sensible option for some hypothetical alternative killer for three reasons. Firstly, there was the presence of Mulshaw just 30 yards away, and he said he saw nothing. Secondly, if you appear from an alleyway in the dead of night, particularly a dark, sinister one, onto a main road, it looks a bit suspicious and is likely to attract more attention than if you appear from a normal side road. So it's less likely to be selected by a savvy baddie. Thirdly, it would require some intimate local knowledge to even know that it was there. There's really only one known suspect who would probably have that degree of local knowledge, and he left the area via Baker's Row, Lechmere, of course. So the culprit would probably have to be another unknown local. Steve Bloomer preferred Court Street, which was the first available normal side turning, and guess what? I agree. Court Street is by far the best option. The next turning, Thomas Street, demands that the killer unnecessarily delayed getting onto Whitechapel Road and the relative anonymity that provided. With the next option, turning left down Baker's Road, delaying it even further. All the other routes were effectively closed and there were not many, many possibilities. If we exclude Lechmere, Whitechapel Road was the only option via a few outlets, of which I would have to agree that Court Street is far away the most likely. But there are other factors that must be taken into consideration which don't merit a mention in the film, even though they clearly have a bearing on any escape route down Whitechapel Road. There were two fixed point police constables on Whitechapel Road. A fixed point occupied a set strategic location so that the public would know where to find a policeman if needed. If they were called away to attend some matter, the next beat policeman to pass by was expected to take their place until they returned, so they were not tied to one spot. One fixed point was opposite Whitechapel Station, around about here, under the jurisdiction of J Division, and one further down on the corner of Great Garden Street, now Greater X Street, under H Division. The constable on duty here was apparently PC Joseph Dredge, 282H. Were they on duty at around 3.45am that morning? Quite possibly. The fixed point shift used to start at 9pm, the same time that the night patrol beat shift started. Up to 1879, it is known that the fixed points often only went on until 1am. However, in H Division at least, some fixed points reportedly continued until 7am. Also, we have PC John Neal, who was patrolling at the time, almost certainly on Whitechapel Road, and his presence must be considered, notwithstanding that other people were about and there was traffic on the road. 
Naturally, Steve Bloomer denies the likelihood that PC Neil was on Whitechapel Road, but he doesn't develop this theory in his film. I know why he likes this theory, and we'll return to PC Neil and how he undertook his beat on a future occasion, as it does have some bearing on the case. I've had to go through all these ludicrous suggestions as an exercise to show how ridiculous it is to suggest that there were many, many options. There were not. If the killer was not Lechmere, then he could have escaped via Court Street with the possibility of Thomas Street and a much smaller possibility of Woods Buildings or left down Baker's Row. So the only sensible scenario for the alternative killer, for whichever name you prefer or no name, is that as Lechmere approached down Bucks Row, the culprit departed unseen and unheard and escaped again unseen via Court Street and for some reason he decided to cover the abdominal wounds. Or is it more sensible to go with what we know? That known individual who wasn't seen or heard by Paul as he approached the crime scene, where the victim was freshly slain and where there were indications that the culprit had been disturbed. A culprit who withheld his true name from the police and the authorities and who got into a dispute with PC Misen over what they said to each other and who was obviously seen leaving the Bucks Row area. A man who delayed in coming forward for three days and then only after the publication of a newspaper story that implicated him. A man who could be linked to all the other crime scenes in the Whitechapel murder list. You know who that man was. So that's it. Besides the, the route we know Lechmere took, the Phantom Killer could only realistically have, have taken one route, down Court Street. There was not a multitude of options. Indeed, there were only a handful of remotely possible routes besides Court Street. To believe that the killer used Court Street, you have to believe that Lechmere missed him and that he quit Bucks Row at most two minutes before Lechmere arrived. And when Lechmere arrived, he of course thought that Polly was a tarpaulin. I hope this has created clarity where there was misinformation. But until next time, thank you for watching. Please subscribe, share, like, ring the notification bell, and of course, comment for a